So what is the relevance of naming this thing, this imperial kind of sovereignty, that whose legitimacy turns around law rather than politics? Why is this thing called empire? Maybe yeah, because definitely. it is a personification of a. So I was thinking that maybe from sovereignty to law, in order to have law, we need to have rights, and in order to have rights, we need to have a a per person. Maybe? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's a stupid thought. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's a very difficult question. No. You were asking that why it, uh, the yeah. nothing before it, yeah? Yeah, why, why is not the empire or an empire? And why is it capitalized? Well, if you are, well, grammatically, English grammar. If yeah. you would be in front of something, it means that you are very, <laughs> very particular. Oh, no, 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 this is very true, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, then, and, and when you are saying A or N, it means that this is empire. Well, this is something. Okay. And then I think perhaps yeah. when you are putting nothing before it, it's something which is which has no puppeteer or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, that's right. That's right. So it's not determined. Yeah. It's not indeterminate. Yeah. Right? Because this is the determining article, this is the indeterminate article. Yeah. And it's capitalized. So is, remember this is an event, right? It's not a substance. I cannot say the tree or a tree. I cannot distinguish between the two. It's an event, right? So is it determinate? Is dynamic, right? Is it determinate? Is dynamic? Empire. Why is it capitalized?
to be a substance. Part and part. Okay, those are the subjects. All right, so, uh, and finally, we say, it's not the empty noun of the previous values, but a positive novelty, a paradigm shift. So what they're saying is, empire is not the crisis in the sense of the decadence, right, or the um, um, disempowerment of a certain order that exists before and now is weaker. Okay? Usually when we speak of crisis, we're speaking of it negatively, defectively, right? They're saying, no, 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 empire is a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift. It's a, it's a new event. It's a new form of sovereignty that has been inaugurated, that emerged with the uh, becoming active of the UN. That's what they say. So it is a centralized construction of norms and far-reaching, I'm reading from their text, and far-reaching production of legitimacy spread out over world space, a dynamic and flexible system structure that is articulated horizontally, and here they made two citations, as a hybrid of Nicholas Luhmann's systems theory and John Rawls' theory of justice. And they say, a governance without government. This is what empire is. And this dynamics is such that conflicts and dissensions strengthen it, furthering its process of integration. Okay, so, uh, in other words, it's a system of governance, and we're not going to get into the Luhmann and Rawls, because it would bring us, you know, too far. But it is a, the presence, the, we call it, now we know what it means, constituted power, okay? And that's something that they, they constantly reiterate. The empire is not um, something that is going to happen. And it's not something whose legitimacy we are deciding. We are talking about something that exists, constituted power. Okay? It's something that exists and that is operative. It is decentered, yes. Um, there are some decentralized construction of norms. It originates, and that's why it's a new event. Okay, it, it's something that has come into uh, play uh, at a certain time. It has not always existed, um, and it feeds on its own crisis and is the center. It is a governance without government and is based on what and here we introduce another notion that we have never actually encountered. And this notion comes from two of the philosophers from France. wrote a very influential book, influential foreign language, called A Thousand Plateaus. It doesn't matter at this point that you will retain it. But they call um, the presence of this order, which looked disorderly, but is nevertheless an order, and that feeds on crisis, the plane of ignorance. A Negrian heart, take it, um, up and without even reworking it that much and say empire works on the plane of ignorance. So anything and everything in empire and that has to do with empire is imminent. Now, what do we mean by imminent here? Any intuition about that? Imminent as opposed to transcendent. Imminence is Of 
God comes with me. That anything that has to do with empire is imminent. Transcending is not like when we are okay, but okay, let's like flowing from something systematically that's transcending and imminent is something which mm -hmm. abruptly happens or something like that. Mm. Okay, okay. Well that's that's an intuition. We are not exactly at the center of it. Um, yeah. Something that is eternally present, which is what what is the subject here? What, what something that is imminent. I imminent is eternally present and uh, part of our being. Mm -hmm. Part of our being. What is the contrast between imminent and transcendent? So imminent and transcendent, if you want to use the adjective. Yeah, you would want to say what is the contrast? Well, the contrast is is, is that uh, something transcendent is something that is seen as something above what our okay. reality is. Okay, very good. So it's a metaphysical concept. Okay. okay. Well, the, it, and well, the other is something. It, it would be what Plato would say uh, is the world of ideas, which okay. is transcendent. Okay. So it's something also for religious. Um, is something we want to reach, but we can't okay. reach. Okay. So transcendent uh, implies a beyond with respect to the imminent, which is what exists here, now, right? Which exists here in this life. It's of course a, a, a religious, religious, uh, it's a concept, it's an opposition or a conceptual distinction of religious derivation, religious of uh, monotheistic derivation, that has to do with uh, divinity transcending, um, you know, uh, the human, the physical, human mortal physical reality, okay? And the immanence as being the dimension, the physical, mortal dimension of human life. So, what are they saying when they say what Hart and uh, Negri, what do they say when they say that empire is imminent? Something which is about to happen. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so can someone else rephrase what Julita said? This is very important. Baby, come on. No, for me I have another idea. Another idea, okay. Yeah, yeah um, I think empire is uh, like the development of the world order. It's the development of the world order, yeah. but how? True. Yeah. But it's imminent, they want to say. Okay, it's imminent. So, okay, Yurita said, I agree with you, it's the development, the development. What do we mean by development? How can development be imminent? And what would be a transcendent development? You know, that's, that's the key of the discussion. Well, it, it is imminent in the sense that it, it doesn't need any external uh, thing to rely on. Okay. Uh, Okay, the motor, the engine, yeah. is intrinsic in it, in what exists already. And the juridical aspect that they very much underline. Okay, just rephrase it yourself, Julia. It was said that imperial sovereignty is bounded in law. So it's bounded in law, okay. Why, why does that imply imminence? Because law is a creation of like real world, it's nothing. It's a creation of like it's it's a reality. It belongs to the world of immanence and not to the world of something transcendent. Okay, very good. 
So law is uh, an artificial creation, as you said. And if we say that it's an artificial creation in, in here, in this conception, because if you ask Kant, is law an artificial creation? For him, no. For him, no. Right? For Kant, law has intrinsic validity to it that makes it possible of being recognized as valid by all universally. Right? So law actually has a transcendent force, right? A normative force. Whereas in the case of empire, we are talking about a conception of the juridical as in effect um, uh, imminent, okay, as existing, and its normativity for every part has to do with its existence. Not only, but is an order, is a juridical body that tends to extend and strengthen itself whenever it is um, called to justify itself. Okay, so let's go back for a second to my question about Kosovo. I don't think we actually answered it. Okay, in what way, so the question before was, but crisis seems to be marginal. And so Negri's and Hart's statement that empire grows on crisis might not be accurate. And so my question was, think of Kosovo and think of the ways in which Kosovo uh, is either local or global crisis. Either local or global crisis. Yeah, but I, my question actually wasn't that. I, I, I understand the question here, but my question, I wasn't saying that crisis is marginal. I was saying that it's, you, you can't say it's the crisis of the whole system if the system feeds on crisis. I'm saying crisis is very important, but it's part of the system, so you can't say that the system is in crisis, but that it feeds on crisis. So it's not really the system which is in crisis, but it's using crisis. Well, let's see. Let's see if it's true. Let's see, because maybe Kosovo, Maybe Kosovo was such a big crisis that because I think in, I think of the regime that it is in, because of what you said before, right? Because it was a sovereign state. It was a sovereign, yeah, yeah. So the UN Charter respects, of course, the right of sovereign states to deal with their own internal issues. Now we have a situation that calls for a, an extrinsic intervention on the part of the UN in the uh, business of a sovereign state, right? <coughs> which explains what Giacomo said before, which is that before that event, you know, before that intervention, which in a way sealed uh, the notion of the humanitarian intervention, right? Um, empire was fallen. And because of the crisis, it became bigger. And it is a world, it, it, it is a systemic crisis. It's not a local crisis, it's a systemic crisis because the very, one of the pillars of the human charter was made to bend, right? Was bent. Because the ethical mandate seemed to grind, you know, to just, uh, to be in need of being reconciled in, in the face of an impossibility of reconciliation with, um, with the, the legal provisions, right? Which are the respect of uh, state sovereignty. So on one hand, ethically, the UN felt the need to intervene. On the other hand, legally, there were issues. Right? But the issues were bent um, and empire became larger and more powerful because of that. You know, that legal scope and legal legitimacy to act within the sovereign, within the space of the sovereign state uh, was expanded. Yeah. But, but then we have to, to face a sort of a limit of uh, because if empire needs 
crisis and through crisis it, it can expand, then there is also, I mean, a limit that cannot be, I mean, that does not allow an empire to expand anymore. And then therefore the, the very essential mechanism is not, it's not anymore, anymore able to operate. Okay, how do you think there is a finite um, uh, space within which empire can expand? Because there is only one, one word. <laughs> but do they, do Negri and Hart think of power territorially? They actually think of power by the political. So actually they think that that space is pretty much in there. Not only because it expands at all levels of human existence, right? But because it evolves through time. And so it's kind of self-replicating. Right? It achieves, that's the importance of thinking in terms of events and of substances. Because empire is never actually identical with itself. It constantly evolves. It's not a structure that is identical with itself, that you look at itself in the mirror and say, here I am. It is actually evolving. So they say at one point, the quote that I already read to you, but I'm going to read again, that the terrain of empire is the terrain of crisis, which in turn is the terrain of exception. Only the name of exception can in authority control the fluid situation. In the name of such exceptionality, imperial right is really a right of the police, which consists in the deployment of prevention, repression, and rhetorical force aimed at the reconstruction of social equilibrium. The juridical power to rule over the exception and the capacity to deploy police force are at the core of the imperial law and authority. Okay? So the only way of uh, ruling or controlling the fluid, okay, a situation which is fluid, and it's fluid in all directions, it's fluid juridically, it's fluid um, medically, it's fluid uh, you know, culturally, it's fluid aesthetically, it's fluid, I mean, they're talking about biopower. So they're talking about, as we know, right, the production of human existence and the disciplining and the control over that. And so what they're saying is that the terrain on which that control can be exercised is constantly an exceptional one. And that's why it seems that, and you know, the, the, the example of Kosovo or the example of uh, um, other international crises, um, think about Rwanda, right? Yeah, I want to say this. Yeah. As, as we said, that uh, a crisis is like a blessing for an empire, so that maybe the uh, empire uses the crisis to save itself. Mm -hmm. I can say that okay, intervention of the UN in Kosovo was not humanitarian because of course it was, yeah. Like, uh, what happened in Rwanda was very really important for the area. I think the crisis in Rwanda, for me, I can say too, it, it was even much worse than that of Kosovo. Mm -hmm. But the UN intervention in Rwanda was very minimal. Right. And by the time the crisis started, there was I can say a hundred of French troops in Rwanda, but they did nothing to stop it. Mm -hmm. But Kosovo uh, happened uh, each and every one last in Kosovo. So right. it means that uh, it was a humanitarian intervention. I can say no, maybe it was something else, but not a humanitarian intervention. In Rwanda, also did that, even more than Kosovo. No one has, they said that we cannot intervene because it's a Inside, in general, in general matters. I know. But also, it's a sentiment. Yeah. They even with this regard. Yeah. Well, that's a very poignant comment. I mean, I, I cannot but agree it was a huge failure, you know. And, and you can say, well, then in Kosovo, they try not to make the same mistake again. You know, this is a sort of uh, optimistic view. But of course, they, didn't, they try not to make the same mistake again also sends a message, you know, also uh, has other implications than the uh, 
the purely ethical uh, subjects of the notion of a humanitarian intervention, right? And actually, here is interesting to notice that um, Negri and Hart talk about um, empire as implementing um, as implementing an order that presents itself as having an ethical force. Okay, empire implements an order that presents itself as having an ethical force. In this case of the humanitarian intervention, really uh, exemplifies, right, this. Because the UN, of course, has this ethical underpinning which we know comes from the Kantian Foundation. You know, the intrinsic value of this structure, which is, doesn't understand itself to be just an artificial um, structure of convenience, right? It understands itself as being a structure with an intrinsic motivation, an intrinsic validity, an intrinsic legitimacy, an ethical legitimacy. <coughs> All right, so um, to bring our discussion to a conclusion, um, Empire, uh, which for uh, Nick and Hart is a concrete universal. It is concrete, is imminent, is part of what there is, you know, doesn't have an extrinsic, transcendent normativity. Um, is, in their reading, a um, development of just war theory. Precisely because of its ethical uh, self-understanding, is a way of you know just for theory is a, a theory produced uh, by European political philosophers with some important roots in the Christian tradition that um, and which begins with a you know. With a piece of this theory, uh, it needs to be a, a component of international relations at that time. So, uh, uh, just for theory is the theory of the legitimate reasons that may bring a country to war. It's used at them, right? Is the legitimate reasons is to the idea of redefine the reasons for which a country may declare war on another country. Of course, not, not, none of it got really implemented uh, before um, the foundation of the UN, right? But just for theory, together with the Kantian tradition, are two fundamental components of this new political order empire that feeds on itself, that has an ethical self-understanding, and that um, Negri and Hart say uh, produces new social and political subjects. Okay, so who are the social and political subjects that this power produces? Remember that biopower, right? Power is not just a constraint. Power is not just primitive, it's not just a constraint, but it's, a, it's formative, it's constitutive. You know, power is the power to form a subject. When we mentioned education in relation to Foucault, we mentioned, for example, medicine as um, part 
ways in which power has expressed itself, thereby forming subjects, social subjects, political subjects, that would work best um, for the specific needs of a certain soft, right? Okay, so uh, which are these subjects that imperial, the empire, imperial power, the empire, the form of sovereignty through law that this empire produces? Um, these subjects are contained in the Jesuit notion of the multitude. which they define as a subject that is not identical with itself. Whereas the disciplinary society, the one that Foucault was talking about, uses power by prescribing normal or deviant behavior, of course, and or so the disciplinary, disciplinary society is based on dichotomies, oppositional pairs um, of concepts, say madness for society, normal versus abnormal, um, you know, honest versus dishonest, good versus evil. The society of control, this is another um, distinction that Foucault himself made is a society where these rules are all internalized by individual subjects. So Mary and Hart take it over from Foucault and say power in the society of control, which is the society over which empire works, right? That empire regulates. Power is exercised directly on the brains via communication networks and on the bodies via the welfare system. How is, how is power directly exercised on, on the brains? Well, by... Okay, let's talk about this. What do you think? How is power directly exercise on brains via the communication networks. How can we explain that? Think about it. How can you exemplify that? Well, that it to the brains and get my uh, communication network. Yeah. I don't know, maybe I'll type to work. How does it form? How communication networks form or interact with the plasticity of the brain. You could spell it out that way, okay? With the plasticity of the brain so that maybe the brain circuits get changed and transformed. What do you mean by communication networks? I mean like bacteria or any? Let's say uh, let's say technologically produced communication networks. Uh, yeah. So communication has to come from a uh, from like not from from other people. I mean, there must be. That's right. Okay. Okay. So communication may not come directly from another person, right? May come from where? What's that? From the, from the screen, from the cloud, right? The cloud of the internet, from the uh, self-reproducing networks that bind together different webs uh, that may be technological, maybe linguistic, maybe uh, political, maybe whatever. Okay. So, so you want to give me an exemplification of the way in which our brain circuits may be directly regulated 
or formed by communication networks. Yeah? Thank you. Um, I'll try to give a simple example. Um, um, for example, uh, Italian uh, news, television news, uh -huh. uh, have frequently um, given <coughs> importance to uh, crimes committed by uh, my, migrants, 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 or immigrants, you know. or immigrants. Oh. and um, therefore it is, mm -hmm. we could hard that in some way a person who apparently maybe is not even believing that uh, uh, immigrants uh, shall, shall, uh, shall be forced to commit crimes, but when uh, a, a person sees an immigrant Sub subconsciously, uh, it might perceive mm -hmm. him as mm -hmm. a threat mm -hmm. because of this uh, constant uh, message. Bombardment. Yes. Oh, yes. Of course. Oh, that's, that, that's more about the content of what is presented in the okay. news. I think the point was um, about like how how our also our brain functions, like the idea um, by which. We are we are constantly we think we know things if we just see an image of it like we we, we have images of all over the world mm -hmm. or so maybe I I can picture what Africa might be like even if I've never been there and so also the idea of how uh, you can gain knowledge in a very superficial way but in a way it's good enough for mm -hmm. for what you think is okay so the the um, the hegemony of images. Yeah, and that's part of how I'll Okay. I mean, I don't think they are in, in mutually exclusive. No, 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 they are not. The they're content not. is more about, I mean, I think the content could, content could vary. Right. So or, was, yeah, you can get well, as deep or as, uh, so, uh, to the syntax or the grammar, yeah. uh, you know, the form or the content, but in substance, you could also say, you know, that we are so used to classifying things. You know, and uh, as we uh, deal with technology, for example, I, you know, last year, last time I taught here, I was even more unfamiliar than I've been this time with the use of this. You know, this regulates me in putting the black on black. Because if I put the black on, on red, I believe it doesn't work. And, you know, it, it, it obliges me to put it back and to put it back in that place. And to have it fit, you know, color with color and shape with shape. So, I mean, you can get as specific or as general as you want, but there is obviously uh, a, a training, you know, a taming of thinking uh, in terms of a certain format that technology and, and you know, and what Henry and Harry call empire um, give us. But, yeah. But instead, how is power exercised on the bodies? I just, I just, uh... Well, on the bodies, uh, you know, through medicine, for example. You know, medicines, uh, through diet, through... Uh, through how uh, we dress all the same. Yeah, through, you know, a certain model of beauty, right, that reaches, you know, generations. You know, people are, you know, as they are younger and younger and younger, and they are more and more and more told on how they should look like. Right? Yeah, but so there isn't a general category that indicates the way in which power is exercised on body. No, no. Okay. No, because in biopower, really, the whole idea of biopower is that of the regulation of their life, of anything that lives, including their life, including the power of life and death over, remember, we write a government, right? Over, over the person who has become homo sapiens and thus uh, their life. All right, so uh, just one last word about multitude. What do you understand the multitude to be? This, this human beings that do not really have a capacity to uh, determine themselves, I mean, to uh, reflect and to act independently, but are there.
there is, is a sort of um, you know, one or two ago when uh, Aaron said a mob. The mob? The mob. Okay, so the multitude is the mob. Okay, let's let's see. The multitude is really important and I wanted to ask you whether you saw any connection between all that we have discussed about today and what is happening right right now in Libya and you know what has happened in Egypt and in Tunisia and in the Arab world. But before we can ask that question, which I was very much hoping to discuss with you, we have to figure out what the multitude means. So the question is, is it the mob? Remember, Anorant presents his new social agent, right? That is the social agent of totalitarianism. That is the mob. The mob which is particularly vulnerable to ideology and ideological manipulation. The mob who needs to belong, you know, to belong to a nation, national belongingness, a nation whether it is an emerging national uh, character or one that needs reinforcement. You know, in the former case is the continental movements, in the latter case is the uh, you know, uh, Victorian Britain, right? Okay, so it's a mo multitude, is it the mob? Maybe it's the, the forms of power. Or maybe it's both. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're talking about an event, right? And power is an event. So how do we define the event? Is there a result of a play of forces? So that's the answer. What's that? That's, that's the answer to what is the what, what, what multi- In what way? In what way is it the answer? So entire multitude. Uh, the multitude is what empire creates. Okay, okay. Right. Okay, it's so the, the multitude is what empire creates. You understand why it's so important to ask this question? Because otherwise politically, what are we going to do with this book, right? We need to know the social subjects that it creates. And the political agency that is left here, right? So Multi is what empire creates. And so to this extent, what Giacomo said, maybe that, uh, you know, for other end, the mob is actually what imperialism creates. So there is a parallel there. But now, this is a new form of imperialism. So there is a structural parallel there, but the content of the mob and the mob are not the same. Okay, the multitude is not the mob. It's the same function, maybe. Maybe. But empire is a very different phenomenon. Okay, so I don't know your name actually. You're Clara. 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 Clara, so what do you mean by the multitude is only empire creates? Well, I mean that you can't I guess the whole idea is that you can't really um, think separately, like different aspects of our social life in a separate way, but everything's obviously connected, so at every level of society. Mm -hmm. And so even our biological or cultural being is influenced, but not only, just molded by the system. It's molded by the system. The simple system, the empire is imminent, as you said. Right. And so being imminent is what really affects us in every Right. Very good. Okay. So there is a functional correlation, right? So empire has to act on something, and that something is the multitude. But empire doesn't act at a specific point in time that is identical with itself. Empire constantly evolves, sorry. Constantly moves. It's a temporal, because it's a dynamic concept. It's not an object. It's an event. So the thing which it acts against, which is the multitude. The multitude resists and empire impinges on it, also changes constantly, right? And that's why the social subject that empire produces it is as empire, not identical with itself. So it's not dialectical. So what is it, right? Multitude is obviously 
the crowd, right? It's obviously everyone. It's us. This is the most difficult part. Can the, given the picture that I made you, can the multitude organize itself? No. That's a huge issue, right? So how do movements of resistance uh, act? Right? How do we resist empire? How do we shape it? If we cannot uh, organize in a stable structure, right? Try to find new ways of um, communicating with other people, for example, uh, not, not using uh, mm, these kind of social networks uh, mm, and to. Uh, Come back to some um, personal contact, personal contact. Mm -hmm. because in this way you can create a, a sort of real web, real contact between people and uh, mm -hmm. organize mm -hmm. uh, a crowd into a organization. Right. Okay, you're talking about, in a way, a space beyond the power. Yeah. Okay. What well, Negri and, um, and Hart envision is that it's a space within empire because they don't believe that anything can actually escape empire. And that's a problem. Because if you could, then it wouldn't be by power. Right? We have by power that, that constitutes human subjects from the ground up. And so nothing actually escapes it. So that's the challenge. Okay? Because the multitude is the social subject and the political agent that is formed by empire. Yeah? I mean, is it, is it a question, uh, can there be movement or resistance, or is it a claim there can't be no movement? No, it's a, it's a form. It's a question, can there be resistance, and if there can be, what? It used to sound like by accident, it, it sounds like a movie, <laughs> like Matrix, but, but still, can, can there be uh, some kind of mistake in within the system which is trying to reproduce something, like reproduce something else, which is kind of capable to, to destroy the system or somehow to change it in an unexpected way? Because you said that we can't change because we are like reproduced and we have something that could be in a mistake. Yeah, I, think, I think that's a great answer. That's one of the answers they would give you. Yeah. There can be some unpredictable uh, exceptions, right? Or exceptions that combine in ways that... We go to another... Uh, we may go to... Yeah, well, but, but you know, maybe in heart wouldn't agree with the periodization. You know, because this is a very fluid and very strong and very kind of unpredictable uh, order. It's an order that seems like a disorder, but actually is an order. And so, and it's completely inert. It doesn't have any normativity that, it, that um, exceeds what exists. And so what is the space of resistance? Well, one of the things that has to be said is that the multitude is produced by empire. So empire, in a certain sense, produces its own conditions of resistance. Right? So empire produces its own conditions of resistance. Because of its biopolitics, and therefore empire is what shapes the multitude. Now, because it's a sprawling and, and, um, and chaotic appeal, chaotic only so far as it is hyper complex, not in the sense that it's completely casual. It's not casual. Or be determined. It is determinist, but the determinacy of it, the rationality of it, is very hard to reconstruct because it's so complex and it's so layered. So, um, empire produces its conditions of resistance, and in producing these conditions of resistance, mind you, this is a very centered uh, structure.
structure, uh, the Lutz and Guattari, who I, Guattari, who I mentioned before, spoke about it, not empire, but the structure of power is reasonable. But the reason is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a mushroom that has no center and no periphery, that sort of spreads um, horizontally. Okay, and very fast, it's very viral. And so this metaphoricity of the viral is also very interesting in this, uh, this juncture. But the multitude is what empire creates, is what empire creates right humanity. Because the uh, strategy of it is not easy to reconstruct. In fact, politics is not the field of strategies anymore, but is the field of, um, uh, I would say, critical assessment of moments of change within a system that develops us all and with respect to which we cannot really oppose a, a totalizing resistance. Okay, this is not a system that can be resisted as a whole. No totalizations are possible, not even in terms of resistance. But the best possible strategy to resist it is in effect the critical observation and assessment of segments of its change. Right? Which are local, which are uh, you know, limited, but do exist. And so how are we going to look, and this is the very last question I'm going to ask you, how are we going to look at what is happening right now in North Africa and in the Arab world from the point of view of the planet? Do you think it's a useful uh, political theory? Is it an apt one that capturing what is happening? Or is it what is happening causing the question? I believe that it, it, it is uh, actually. A little bit louder. I believe that it is actually not a, a positive crisis because it, those crises were not were not foreseen. It, they were unexpected. So this is why maybe they they are they are negative. No, but I'm not asking positive or negative. I'm asking whether the the framework of empire helps us understand it or whether. Um, um, it is an appropriate framework of interpretation. Okay, does it fit or not? That's what I'm asking. Okay, the fact that, this, that they were unpredictable, whether or not they were unpredictable is all but clear, but certainly would make empire, the theories of empire feel proud. You know, because they are saying that even though empire is a structure and is an order, and thus is not casual, uh, it is very hard to predict because it's so complex and so layered that you cannot think about it in terms of a causal, uh, you know, chain. You gotta take care of what they're gonna say yeah. because if he's a crazy yeah. guy, so you have the oil. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, another way of, of, of thinking about it is, um, and, and I'm very pleased that you were able to, to apply this complex theory in these many ways, but a, latter, a, a last way of, of thinking about it is the way in which the multitude organizes itself. Because, I mean, we are talking about the response of empire to the multitude, but the way in which the multitude came about, right? Because the multitude in um, degrees and hearts Theorization is a group of people who have nothing in common. Right? And that's what is so hard uh, to organize uh, horizontally. Because these are, uh, remember that the empire is constituted rhizomatically. Right? It disperses itself as it grows. It is a deeply and structurally decentered structure. And so multitude, which is the response and the resistance to empire, has the same structure. So how to organize resistance is a systemic issue, right? And the truth is that in this case, we have had, I think, 
an example of a non-ideological, <clears throat> right? Because of a non-ideological formation of resistance that maybe has exploited the vulnerability of the system, maybe has come out of uh, you know some mistakes, as Rita was saying, you know, some some serendipitous. Um, uh, modification in the course of things, but certainly uh, this is the case of a coordination of action in resistance uh, to um, to uh, a stable and very oppressive um, power, right? Which was integrated in empire because it was. It was integrated in the UN, it was integrated commercially, it was integrated in all of those, right? And that has not had the uh, fabric of the modern mass of the mob. Because there is really no ideology, despite the West's attempt to say, you know, we're so worried about the fundamentalists. I mean, there was no fundamentalists to be seen there, right? There was no, I, I was listening to, um, to a political analyst saying, well, there was not one single American flag being born, being burnt. Okay? There wasn't. There was no single Al Qaeda poster being shown. There was no uh, Israel flag being burnt. I mean, I haven't seen any. Right? So it wasn't really ideological. It was based on solidarity and a hope for more politics to happen in those countries. So it's really interesting. I think it's a very interesting case. And so on this happy note, I will say goodbye to you. <laughs> you have another question? Okay. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Sure. I have two questions. Two questions. Yeah, okay. My first question is, uh, what made capitalism to win over communism? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is that um, I've, been, I've been studying genocide for a very long time, uh -huh. but until this time, I don't know what genocide is. You don't know what genocide is? Yes, genocide. And uh, we started in another episode about the genocide in the country of the future. Alright, alright. So, what made you, is this, just looking back at the whole course that makes you feel that you're lacking this, or you think that you're lacking this, or do you have any association with this specific topic? Well, I, I, think, I think it's very it's very relevant because of the humanitarian issue, right? Because the humanitarian issue was in effect uh, you know, the, the whole idea of the the responsibility, the duty to intervene, uh, cancer and, and the reason why Kosovo, you know, at least in an optimistic reading, was dealt with better than Rwanda was that uh, you know, the winning powers of the Second World War correctly feel rather guilty about not having prevented, you know, the genocide of, of uh, the Holocaust. And so the idea, the, the normative justification of, um, of humanitarian rights is that of protecting um, the dignity of the human being as such, right, that is being destroyed in just the case of genocide. Is, is perpetrated. When you're killed just because of who you are, it's not because of what you do, it's because of who you are. Right? Then there's a huge discussion about uh, what genocide actually means, and uh, you know, there are several theories of genocide, and, but certainly one of the normative justifications, I would say the principle of the entire right is that. And so I think it's very relevant. Okay, to be continued. Thank you very much.